Welcome to the Bridge Street Fellowship. It is lovely to see a pretty full room and also welcome everyone who's online. We're expecting about 50 people joining us online as well. Now, I'm standing in the place that normally Oliver Greaves would be. Oliver has returned from overseas. Um, you can attest to that, Ian. Have you seen him yet? He's alive. He's alive. Great. Um, but he's got COVID. So he can't be here to, to officially welcome us this morning. So I'll, I'll do those honours before we get to meet Tim in just a second. So firstly, I just want to say a special welcome for all the men who have come for the first time today. And I can see there's a good half dozen or so first time here. I won't embarrass you to, by asking to put your hand up and everything, but it's wonderful you're here. And also, if you're here for the first time online, that's fantastic as well. So just very quickly... Why are we here? What are we doing at this hour in the morning? And then we'll get underway with the interview with Tim. So we're the Bridge Street Fellowship, and we've existed for about 15 years. And I guess at the core, what we're on about is men coming together, becoming friends, sharing life together around a common theme of exploring what difference would it make if we have a trust in God, those from a Christian perspective, a trust in Jesus, through everyday life. That's really the common theme, particularly exploring when life gets pretty difficult. And we've had the privilege of hearing some amazing stories from men over those 15 years, stories of, you know, dealing with parents with dementia, kids with anorexia, issues of, of, of violence, of addiction, all sorts of things have come up. And we find that when we're open and honest about these things, it changes the dynamic in the room, uh, the literal room, but generally, metaphorically speaking. So we've really enjoyed these 15 years, and we hope that you enjoy today and get something out of it. And uh, today, we have the privilege of uh, hearing from Tim Wright. Now, Tim um, has a, had a career in education. He started out in chemistry and has been best known for his role as the headmaster of the Shaw School over the bridge in North Sydney. And uh, I won't go more into that because that will obviously unfold in the interview. So let's welcome Tim. Thank you, Tim, for coming in. That's a pleasure. I hope I'm visible on the camera. And uh, I'm particularly flattered that at least two people in the room were here on Tuesday. So either I was absolutely scintillating or I was so totally unclear they've come back to see if they can get a better idea. <laughs> I don't think we'll test. Yeah. Um, now, we'll come back to that role that you were as headmaster of Shore, and there's a lot of themes we'll explore there. But um, what, what do you do these days? I set up a small leadership um, coaching and mentoring business. As I was saying to one of um, the people uh, outside, I think it was Cliff, um, they, a lot of people move into leadership in middle management, senior management, because they're good at things at the let next level down but it doesn't necessarily mean they've got the full suite of skills and I don't mean they're incompetent but actually they have to do things they didn't have to do before so I've found a reasonably healthy client list probably I couldn't expand it more and I'm really enjoying that and the interesting thing I'm talking about from my perspective I know not, not everybody here is a Christian but from my perspective it's funny how often I can say well look I'm bringing to this my own Christian perspective, and I think from that, I think these are important things to consider. So it's actually turning out to be a very fruitful opportunity for, for speaking about faith as well. Wonderful. So the journey, though, in education, uh, it wasn't straight out of uni, was it, by any means? So no. you tell us a little bit, you know, what you started doing and, and what led to the change. This is one of my favourite um, stories of life. I... I went to do a postdoctoral professional officer job at the University of New South Wales under a guy called David Black, who was a professor of organic chemistry there, a very fine man. And after three years of somewhat um, average performance, because I, I was running youth group at church and I was involved in uh, all sorts of things outside, still playing rugby, um, I got fired in probably the best way you can fire someone that is 
David called me in and said, Tim, are you enjoying this work? And I sort of thought about it and I, well, I didn't really need, need to answer, did I? The fact that he had asked the question was he knew the answer. <laughs> and basically it became quite clear that I had about three months or so um, to find a different job. And I, I, look, I think it's, it's wise. It's one of those things where if the fit and the motivation is not there, good leaders say to somebody, this isn't you. you. Um, and I have to say, I've used that technique myself. Um, <laughs> since. Um, and at the same time, friends had turned up to church. Guy I'd been on beach mission with, a member of the executive team at Trinity. He said, Tim, come see Rod West. So I went and saw Rod. Rod talked to me for a couple of hours um, in his in inimitable way. And... Uh, said, I'll have a job for you at the end of the year. My wife is totally convinced the reason Rod wanted me was the diameter of my neck. Um, she, he, she thought, he just thinks you'll be able to coach rugby because you look like it. Um, and there may be truth in that. How did the rugby team go at Trinity? Um, in those days, it was pretty strong. Um, I, I took the second 15 to the premiership in 1992. Mind you, that was a totally different era of schoolboy sport. That was still two sensible training sessions a week, turn up on Saturday, play well, but it what hadn't become the sort of semi-professional obsession that it is. And I'd have to say, as a head, that was one of the things I was most disturbed about was sport becoming more and more the purpose of an existence for many boys. And I don't, I think it's an a fantastic adjunct and I loved it through my boyhood and early manhood but really there are more important things well we won't go into the decline of shore rugby no. right now but <laughs> don't worry you don't need to respond you don't need to respond to the that. only thing that matters at shore is rowing yeah 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 uh, <laughs> now in, in explaining that sort of transition out of organic chemistry into education, you did mention your church and youth group. So tell us, what, what was your sort of faith journey that, at the same time? Um, my faith journey, my life journey is quite, um, well, I think it's interesting, but we're always fascinated by ourselves, aren't we? Um, uh, my dad was the youngest son of a Northern Irish family under traditions of primogeniture he was never going to inherit anything his elder brother got the farm so he went off got educated and off with the um her majesty's imperial colonial service to africa uh, where he met my mum um, she was a dietitian he nearly died of malaria they got married um, about the age of four my mother was diagnosed with um very serious bowel cancer and she died when I was four and you know I've only got the vaguest memories of her really very clear memory of dad telling me that mum had died but dad went off back off to Africa I lived with an uncle and aunt people of very deep Christian faith dad had a faith but I wouldn't have said it was a strong um faith i'm not saying that this doesn't make it real because you know that faith is a grain of mustard seed but um when he was in back in africa i think seeking as men do to redeem the time in terms of throwing himself into work and back into everything and all that trying to cope as men did in the late 50s early 60s um he met my stepmother, who was a profoundly Christian woman and a, a very, um, very 17th century Puritan type of Christian woman. And she was the most wonderful um, person. I, I call her mum. Uh, she's passed on to glory now, but she was profoundly influential in me, um, introduced habits of family. Um, prayer bible reading i was saying on tuesday that when you had a friend over for a sleepover something like that she would come to the bedroom door throw it open like one of those characters out of a horror film and say have you read your chapter yet and then 
and close the door and go and the person saying, what, what's this chapter? I've got to read a chapter of the Bible. Did you say you've got to read a chapter of the Bible? Yes. And knowing she would ask me about it the next morning. Um, but as I, I think that what she's doing, she's always pinning, pinning, pinning. Stand, stand, stand. And so mid-teenage years, um, I think I had a very good understanding of the faith in terms of an intellectual apprehension. Um, and we were sitting at church. Dad was in counting money. He was the rector's warden and she was in the front seat. I was sitting behind her. She's staring straight ahead. I'm sort of daydreaming in the back of her hand, her voice like a, you know, absolute cleaver. You have to make a decision. And she, it wasn't a conversation starter. It was just, you have to make a decision. And she was absolutely right. Um, because I think I, I knew the truth. What I had to do was to, to submit to the truth. And so in, the, in that, um, uh, the ensuing days and weeks, um, that sort of really took hold on me. And I think that that was the absolute, I, I, I wouldn't say it was the instant, but it was, the, it was the absolute moment that said, you know, you think you're pulling the wool over everybody's eyes, you're pulling the wool over nobody's eyes and you've got to do something about it. And, and then you got quite ill later that year, is that right? Yeah, I developed a disease called ulcerative colitis, which is surprisingly more common these days than it used to be. Um, almost unknown in the third world. So what does that mean? I don't know. Um, and I lost a quarter of my body weight. It was still at that stage a very dangerous disease. You know, just a decade before it would have been a death sentence. Um, I was rushed up to Sydney after about six weeks of the local doctors just not diagnosing it correctly. My mum knew what it was, interesting enough, that she had been a nursing sister in Africa. What she didn't know about disease was, um, or physical injury, um, wasn't worth knowing. So we came up, and interestingly, a guy called um, Senator, now Pete, he was Senator Peter Bone, but he was a, then a gastroenterologist, and he treated me and um, turned things around got me stable again um, and I've actually lived with that disease throughout my life in remarkably well considering how debilitating it is for a number of other sufferers. And, and do you think that experience maybe crystallised that moment that you have to make a decision? Um, it wasn't a fear of death but I think it was it was the dawning of the realisation that God doesn't necessarily call you to a life of ease and um, I, I think it, I, I think I look at some of um, the Catholic teachings on suffering and I think sometimes we in well when I say we I'm talking about Protestant Christians like me not everybody in the room we tend to pray things like Lord make it stop I think genuinely we probably should be saying give me the strength to persevere um, and I think, so I think I slowly have got to that point. And I think that disease really helped in that situation. All things work together for good for those who love God. So let's then move forward. Um, you've gone into education, you worked at Trinity, you then became a head of a school in Bathurst. What were some of the lessons you learned in those formative years of your leadership development? Retrenching staff is a brutal thing to do. Um, my first year, I inherited a school that was in financial crisis, um, making a pretty large loss. Um, in schools, there is only one cost driver that matters, and that's staffing costs. So um, laying people off. And in the educational world, nobody really believes that there is a financial problem. Um, they just you know, the government will save us. That actually doesn't happen like that. But that was also profoundly important um, experience because doing that personally, engaging with the people directly, not having somebody do it for me, I think it was really um, important. 
And I have to say, at the end of that night, I um, uh, sat and cried for about three hours. There's always a brutally funny side of this. Every school has its resident cynic. It was the day of the athletics carnival. The starter for the um, races was a, a history master there um, who would raise the gun and say, anybody else for the headmaster's office? And then <laughs> pull the trigger. Um, I can laugh about it now. I wasn't happy at the time, but yeah. But I, I learned then that actually me with my intelligence, my so-called rationality, my ability to see the answers and that experience of laying stuff off was one of those primary things is people aren't actually rational. They're deeply emotional. They're connected um, to life. And, and the notion you can just say situation A, inputs B, logical outcome C is all very well until you're dealing with the people in the moment. And that's when I realised that actually relational um, leadership, I was always a fairly gregarious sort of person, but one of the really important things in leadership is to manage your relationships well, because you've got to build the trust. Um, because if you don't have trust, no matter how smart you are, no matter how right you are, it's not going to work. And I learned that at All Saints. So you then became the seventh headmaster of the Shaw School in a, in a long history of, what, 130, 140 years. So they don't have headmasters very often. Uh, did you feel the weight of that responsibility? Were you concerned you might stuff up? Um, I wasn't concerned that I might stuff up. Self-confidence has never been a lack of mine. Um, it's a safe place. <laughs> uh, I think anybody who knows me would tell you that, Alan. Um, the, I, I did feel the weight. I'm a great, I've, I've been in love with these sorts of schools for a long time, even though I'm a product of a state high school. Uh, and Rod taught me a lot about it. But there's that, you walk into a history, you don't walk into a, it's not a greenfields. There's a history behind you. There are traditions, there are personalities who even 70 years later speak into the life of the school. You've got to be aware of that. And the, and the challenge is to take what's precious, what's treasured, and then find what you will add to it. Um, and I think I felt the weight that you don't do things flippantly or foolishly, um, because the things like the USS Missouri, if you want to turn it, you need to start five kilometres out um, because it's not going to turn on a dime. So it's a bit like a battleship running yeah. the school. So Shaw is a Christian school. Um, it also attracts a very wealthy clientele. How in your mind did you balance the influence of, I guess, money and power with the Christian ideals of the school? I think, I didn't say this on Tuesday, but um, I think that it's important to understand the nature of the school and the, the school is a covenant community. Um, it must be headed by somebody who is in direct covenant with the faith. Um, other people join the covenant, and as they do that... Can you just explain what do you mean by covenant? Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's, that's jargon talk. I'm, I apologise for that. A solemn agreement between a human being and God. Abraham's a classic example. Um, you might remember when uh, he sacrifices animals, cuts them in half, and then the smoking fire pot goes between them in Genesis um, and it seals the agreement. So people come in and they understand. And I think the deal is this. We have a Christian purpose. We exist to tell you about Jesus, who he is, and why he's important and why living in faith is a good idea. And we also, on they want an educational result. The Christian purpose, educational duty, we've got to do the education stuff really well they've got to accede to the fact that we're a Christian school and their kids will have Christian studies, they will go on camp, they will go to chapel, those sorts of things. And that is that is the deal. Um, but when you come to, to the wealth, I, 
I recognise that in different schools, the dynamics are quite different. I would say that I get, did not ever get from what you might call the really wealthy people, the notion that they were saying, we'll give you money if you do this. And we had a whole lot of policies at council level that said you can't actually have those conversations. So if somebody was giving us money, they had to do it for something we wanted to do anyway. Um, on the other hand, I think there are some people who felt because they were paying fees and they weren't necessarily always all that wealthy. Um, the only real yelling session I ever had uh, was when I got one of my staff very upset about a comment that had been made. I rang the parent and I said, if you ever say to one of my staff that they will do what you say because you pay their wages, I'll terminate your son's enrolment. Um, because you just can't have people thinking that because they pay money, um, that comes back to the covenant. You signed up, we've made a promise, we'll deliver on our promise, but you don't tell us what we promise. Um, having had three kids who've passed through um, high school and just, I guess, getting a sense for the age in which we live, we're, we're told these days that children can become anything, be anyone. Um, how does that sort of mentality sit with the ideal, I suppose, in, in your school, that life is about service? So how, how do you balance those two things? Um, that's a particularly nauseating lie. Um, I never propagated that. I was a great believer in telling boys um, or, and girls when I was at All Saints as well, um, that you persevere, you seek to do your best, you apply yourself, but you can't, you're not guaranteed outcomes. And the Disney option, which permeates our broader popular culture, if you have a dream and you follow it, it will come true, is a heartbreaking lie. Um, it just doesn't actually correspond to realities. And I think in the end, it, it builds kids into um, some very dangerous places where life doesn't work out the way they thought it would. Um, I think it's much better saying to people, build these habits, build these virtues, build this character, and you've got a better chance of dealing with the vagaries of life. Because, you know, we all know, everybody in this room, every human being that's lived for any length of time knows life can be absolutely awful at times. And there were some awful times while you were at the school. What, what were some of the hardest experiences? Um, undoubtedly, the suicide of students is deeply, uh, it's deeply troubling. I think that's where almost the fabric of the universe tears back and you see some of the evil that exists that we have to um, face and in faith deal with. Um, I find that particularly difficult because um, you've got to grieve, you're individually grieving, but you've got to lead a community and your grief must be authentic and public. It doesn't help the community if you stand up there with a stiff upper lip and all the rest of it. You've got to lead the community in expressing the grief. But at the same time, you've got to say some things that are pretty tough. Every time that happened, I needed to just say publicly, so-and-so made a terribly bad choice. And there was always an option for us that wasn't this one. Because you never want to do the validation or the heroism. Um, I think asking students to leave the school is pretty hard. What I noticed is over time, I got less and less willing to do that. It's not that I wouldn't do it, but I think when you're young and probably not so wise, you make decisions very quickly without necessarily thinking about all the ramifications. But on the other time, sometimes students do things that just say you can't continue. But that's hard. And I think sometimes firing people who are nice, good people, but totally incompetent is really difficult as well. Because, you know, it, I really did not mind firing the three or four people I fired over my years who were just horrible people. 
and they're easy to fire because usually they're firing them because they've been horrible to somebody. But the ones who are just, you know, bumbling along, that's difficult. And you do get that challenge sometimes. You know, I thought this was a Christian school type stuff, which is, you know, you get it. Yeah. So you are quoted as having said uh, that perhaps your most humiliating experience uh, in leadership was after the release of a letter that you co-signed around the time of the same-sex marriage plebiscite where you alongside other heads called on the government to protect religious freedoms in school and that led to quite a bit of backlash. Can you tell us about that experience? I think backlash is an understatement. <laughs> um, well, the timing was poor, wasn't it? Um, uh, I think Steve McAlpine, Western Australia, said it was analog communication in a digital age, and I'm an analog sort of guy. Um, uh, I'm pretty impressed I can actually operate a phone, but um, I, I regretted the use of the word humiliating. I think I should have said humbling, but you know, I was I was pretty emotionally raw the day the journalist rang me. Um, one of, the, one of the dangers is having an old boy who's a journalist who actually has your phone number. Um, because I'd been that morning um, working with a, an old boy from quite a while ago in the school um, and his very elderly mother. He had been sexually abused um, when he was at school by fellow students and he was gay. And, you know, he's sitting there and you've written this letter and... Um, we had got through that, got the phone call. I wish I'd said humbling, but the circumstances where we're trying to say, we don't use this legislation, but you're proposing to remove it, what's there to protect us? Um, because most of us want to be able to preference people in our employment decisions who can support the faith base of the school. Now, a school like Shaw, not everybody does, um, but we were certainly, I would have had a preference uh, for people who could intelligently um, support the faith basis of the school on a personal conviction basis. And there are other schools I work with where you have to be a practicing Christian to be able to be employed. So it was about protecting that space, but it was badly done. Um, I wish though I'd known at the time what I learnt subsubsequently, and interesting enough, uh, I, I asked for no affirmation of, of, of this, but you know, Jordan Peterson says this as well. And um, you, get, you get the storm of negative response and two weeks later, all the support comes in. So about two weeks later, I started getting parental letters, communications. Um, and I remember up at the first 11 cricket game, um, one of my country dads, very gruff spoke, a rough spoken guy and not uh, not uh, from a faith basis at all but he said i thought it was a good letter i know what you want you want people who agree with what the, you're trying to do in the school i think it was great and <laughs> walked on <laughs> um well, what were some of the you say in hindsight you would have done it differently so what are some of the lessons i guess you you learned through that difficult time yeah when you're communicating and the press are going to get hold of it, you need to recognise that every single sentence is going to be taken as a standalone unit. I would have written a much shorter letter uh, in retrospect, and I would, not, I would have just focused on the right to the hire and fire. It, it tried to be too elegant in its argument, and um, elegant arguments don't, don't fly well um, in, in the public space. And, and I gather there was also some healing that came out of it. Yes. Um, I had lots of phone calls from um, old boys who were gay. Um, who, and every one of those who rang up or contacted me, I contacted, invited them in if they wanted to come in. And they did come in um, uh, by and large. And we had really good conversations. And I think, and that the other lesson is, um, and I think everybody in the room knows the truth that when you're in an argument with someone, settle it face to face. Don't, like, don't get your lawyers to write letters. Don't send emails. Don't leave voice calls and don't send those 
three word texts. Um, I won't name what three words, but um, human beings, when they're face to face, find it so much easier to reconcile and um, come to understanding. And, and lots of those conclusions ended with hugs or handshakes. And yeah, I think. So I've, I learned a lot. And that's one of the things, you know, I'm 66. One of the great things about life that I found is every year you learn something new, you get better at something. I'm not, I've yet to get to the other side of the hill where every year I forget something, but I'm sure it will happen. But I think that's also that growth mindset that we've all got to have as human beings, as men, is um, what, what does life, what does God have in store for me today? And that I think we've got to engage as much as we can in learning. You've, you've taught at boys' schools now for, for some time. You've thought a lot, no doubt, about what does it mean to be a boy, a man, uh, the whole theme of masculinity. Um, one of our number, Al Stewart, who would have been here, but he's online, he's just recently uh, written a book on getting masculinity right, uh, the manual, um, the substance of which is really a number of talks Al has given here over the last 15 years. In fact, Al dedicates the book to the men of the Bridge Street Fellowship. That's, well, there you are, Al. Somebody says it's great. <laughs> quick work, Stuart. Quick work. And uh, I should say it's available for $20 out in the foyer. Um, if you're on the retreat, grab your free copy. Um, so your thoughts around kind of healthy masculine culture i think it's a great thing to be a man um i actually try ceased to use the word masculinity quite some years ago um i talked about manhood i think um manhood and, and because we're in a, a male grouping i don't have to qualify this by saying and women too but i will just make the observation what i say about men is different it sometimes looks different for women but um, it, the truth still applies because the issue is never toxic masculinity, it's toxic humanity and um, the, the fact that every human being is flawed. Um, I think there are some absolute truths that we've walked away from over the last 200 years. Um, Aristotle, um, with his the virtues of the citizen of Athens, the citizen of Polis, Wisdom, courage, uh, justice, and oh, trying to temperance. Um, a key Aquinas took those up in the um, Middle Ages, uh, put a, a very Christian uh, um, um, interpretation on that. I don't hesitate to use the word gloss. We walked away 200 years ago, height of the um, Enlightenment, we walked towards. Uh, a view that somehow rationality was a good thing, utilitarianism, economics um, being the measure of success. The measure of a man is in his character. And the character needs to be formed. And this is true whether you are a person or not a person of faith. I, I obviously think that faith, because of as a Christian, the work of the Holy Spirit in my life makes it live more actively but i it's not true to say that non-christians can't have virtue that's just you know rubbish but the, i think the virtues of manhood are courage <clears throat> nurturing of other people protection of other people a desire for justice telling the truth and you know every one of us knows how difficult that is at times um, but you know Stanley Howis, a new college, I remember him saying, oh, and one thing, never, ever, ever lie. Um, very good, good base point. We all fail and we're never perfect, but virtue is our habits built over time. And young boys need to be taught this is important to think about and orient yourself to do, and they've got to be given opportunities to practice what that looks like. And men, as they enter into life, need to constantly ask themselves the, the reflective question, 
is what I'm doing right? Um, the key to leadership, and most of you guys have leadership, as some of you very senior leadership, some of you will grow to senior leadership. The key to effective leadership is to understand it is a moral position. And if you're a man who's a leader, the morality of your position is really important. And I don't mean necessarily that you don't smoke and you don't drink too much. I'm talking about the fact that you run your business with justice. The right people get the right jobs. That you run your business with truthfulness. You don't rely upon a marketing department that lies about what you do. It's really important for us as men to embrace the concept of virtue. Now, for Christians, we see that play out in the uh, book of Galatians. Paul nominates the fruits of the Spirit. If you think about it, them love, joy, peace, gentleness, patience, uh, faithfulness, and self control. Against such things, there is no law. Um, they can't legislate against you being virtuous. Um, so don't worry about that. But also in those fruits, there are the consequences of virtue joy, patience. These are things that I think characterize the ideal man. And it's not the fact that you can bench press 80 kilograms or that you can drive a golf ball. Not, I'm, I go do weights and I play golf. But those sorts of things that we, or that you can sink, sink 10 schooners and still stand, those sorts of um, shambolic and shabby misrepresentations of manliness, we actually have to speak against all the time but on the fact that we must realise that God put us for a purpose, a telos, a destiny, and that we ought to live that. And I, I don't mean by what I'm saying from, for Christians in the room. I'm not saying that being virtuous makes us right with God, but if we are right with God, he expects us to be virtuous. He expects us to be conformed to being like Christ. And for many who don't share that faith, God has placed within you the capacity in his general providence and his general um, design of humanity that the pursuit of what is right is good and fulfilling, and that's manhood. You've thought about this a bit. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's thank Tim for this time. Thank you, Tim, uh, for your, your uh, honesty and um, for taking us into the lives of the school and the boys. Obviously, there's a role of the school in covenant to raise the boys. Um, then there's the responsibility of the parents. Um, how did you get engaged the fathers in the community and, and what sort of things did you do to connect the boys to the dads to sort of create um, that connection? We quite regularly had things like father-son um, breakfasts and uh, lunches, those sort of things, which I, I would briefly speak. I mean... Nobody turns up to that to have half an hour, but, you know, three or four minutes about the importance of the relationship. I think we, um, in our pastoral care program, we had in, in that uh, a virtues education program called Building Good Men. And it's interesting how much over time uh, that came back to me through parents saying, oh, so-and-so was saying this um, and uh, about what they'd learnt in, at school today. One of the things I did, my assemblies were nearly always, they had a virtues focus. I didn't make them specifically Christian. Sometimes there were Christian references, but they had chapel. And, you know, you just got, have to steer that fine line that the kids don't think they're getting a, an evangelistic sermon every time anybody speaks to them. Um, and in those, I was always banging on about the virtues. Um, and I published those. So the parent body read them as well. And we got a, ver a lot of very favourable feedback about that. Um, people saying, we're loving what you're doing at the school. Not you, Tim, but you, the team. Um, and so I think it's about communicating what you stand for um, and making sure that people understand that. I always speech day there was always some theme in the speech day speech that talked about why we were a Christian school. I wrote a, um, uh, a faith basis for the school 
and that was published on the website last time I looked, it was still there. Um, uh, so we try to communicate, being a good school is a, consequences, is a consequence of us being a Christian school, not that being a Christian school is somehow an additional thing. And I think it's about how you frame your thinking. And I think that's one of the sloppinesses about modern um, world. We've got quite a few questions yeah, coming in, absolutely. so we'll, we'll keep them snappy. A question in here from a professor of science, just a heads up. You've said that the enlightenment virtue of rationality has its limits. Can you unpack that a little more? Um, I, th I think that um, one of the things we know, for instance, about our brains um, is they're connected very powerfully to our emotions. So we know that when we've got to do something that's quite challenging or or difficult you feel it here it's not something necessarily going on in in here um, i think the i think the the mistake of the enlightenment and rationality was to say all answers can be thought to and reached and i don't think that that's um, the reality and the downside of that i mean i have a phd in organic chemistry but the downside of that is um, in some areas in our tertiary um, universities for some time if it's not factual or if it's not scientific it's either not relevant or it's not true um, and that's that's um, a very narrow view of epistemology in my view we're moving into a post-science era anyway so science science will struggle uh, a little bit to have the general acceptance that it once had and we saw a bit of that in the last three years yes Question in the room. Tim, Bill Cummins, thanks very much. It was fantastic. Um, the What you teach at uh, Shaw, the virtues, uh, fantastic, and um, education. I'm uh, just wondering what your thoughts are about uh, the impact it's made on the um, students when they leave school. I think if I look at uh, Peter Caldor, a fantastic, um, outstanding example of... Um, okay, uh, next question. <laughs> I think... It's an important yeah, one, question? so I just want to finish it. Um, but um, if I look at that, I think you know where I'm leading with this question. Um, besides, Peter, do you think there are many um, old boys actually... Uh, sorry, you're putting me off a bit, Pete. Do you think there are many old boys like Peter uh, spreading the good news? Uh, sure, old boys. I mean, um, um, a, a surprising number of um, Anglican clergy in the diocese are sure old boys. Now, whether that means they're doing a great job, I don't know. Um, that's a that's a bit disrespectful. They are. Um, I I once had an old boy say to me, Tim. Sooner or later, we get it. That's not that's not to say that we don't have boys who left school eight years ago, who have slept with fifteen different women and are drunk on Friday nights. I you know, I don't pretend in the modern world or in any world that's ever existed that everybody who's taught what right takes it up. On the other hand, I think a lot of people get shaped by it. And I still get communication, having lunch next Friday with an old boy who has shaped his life around what he learned at school, although he's not a Christian. So have we done a statistical survey? No. Do I think it was um, wasted? No, I don't think that when you do what is right, that it ever fails to bear fruit in one way. God blesses all sorts of things. A question here on the text. How do you promote growth mindset in environments that often support fixed mindsets, such as schools and church traditions? I don't think either of those support fixed mindsets. I would say, for instance, I would say that good tradition is a liberating thing. Tradition is a dynamic um, platform in which you build the future. And I think people who don't know their traditions are unanchored. Um, we all live in a story, both individually and collectively. Um, I, I certainly don't think that the modern school supports fixed mindsets. I think it's very important that you don't get into this is who you are. I, for instance, I would never allow, um, if I was reviewing a report and I read lots of reports, if I picked up a teacher had written, James is a bright student, I would change that situation because that's a fixed mindset statement. Um, I wanted students to realise that there was an ongoing 
um, capacity. Uh, I, I think fixed mindsets are very often built into the broader culture, but I, I think um, church traditions are a great thing. Um, you, ne you don't need to tell me that what I do and don't like about modern church music. Uh, no, we won't go there. <laughs> we won't go there. Okay. Uh, a, a question here. Um, would you agree that men in our society are still learning how to get along well with women in leadership? If so, what are the significant areas where we need to take a good look at ourselves and learn to do better? Um, if you ever sit in a, in a meeting with men and women in it, it's surprising how often you will see men talk over the top of women. Um, and you're, it's um, surprising how often I, I, I watch this in my small group that I lead on Tuesday night, the other night. A woman made three attempts to speak and a man kept speaking over the top of her until I actually had to say, can we hear what so-and-so? So I think one of the things that we've, we have to do as men is we've got to, um, to use an NFL image, we've got to run interference. We've got to be the left tackle for women and make sure that they've got the space um, at times to because they don't necessarily have that brash Tim Wright, I've got an opinion and everybody's dying to hear it. Um, so I think that's one thing we need to do. One of the things we need uh, as well to do is to make sure that women are given the opportunities to um, socially integrate in leadership the way men do. Men often run a lot of activities. One of the heads, uh, women, female heads um, of a well-known school in the eastern suburbs once said to me, Tim, have you noticed that at, when the heads get together, many of the men go off to play golf and the women aren't invited? Mm. Um, so I, I, these might be trivial levels, but I think I'm not, for instance, I'm not a great believer in saying there must be a quota I, I don't think that, that actually is helpful. I don't know that I would have ever wanted a job that somebody said, you fit the quota requirements. Um, but on the other hand, I think we need to make sure we don't appoint people who are just like us. Mm. I think that's a really important issue in leadership appointment. Um, okay, I've got, there's lots more questions here. We're gonna to have to be very quick. Just a very, just a very quick follow-up on that. What role do you think, so we, you're talking about you know, like the golf exercise. As a married man, if I ask three or another woman to go and play golf with me, that has implications on, on my relationship. It's also an opportunity for gossip. How do we solve that? Um, quickly. I, quickly. Um, I, I think you don't go it as a couple. You go in a group. I don't think it would cause... I, I think anybody who would gossip about, about that is just simply malicious. And we can't live our lives on the basis of malice. Okay, a question here. What is the paramount benefit you have experienced as a Christian in your outstanding career? You don't have to comment on the outstanding bit. But... No. Um, uh, undoubtedly, I am a completely different human being to the one I would have been if I hadn't been a Christian. Um, you would have seen traces of it today, but I would have been profoundly arrogant. I would have been profoundly self-opinionated. Um, I think I would have been a bully. And God saved me from that. Um, but I've also been married to a woman who has incredible patience and loves me. Um, I've... I've journeyed with Christians there. I have several Christian friends who've been Christian friends of mine for 50 years. And they're just with me. They're the sorts of friends you want in life. When, you know, when that letter came out, phone rang. There's Bill. How are you traveling? Um, other crises. Uh, I've known Peter Jensen, for, for instance, for many years and other crises in the school. Peter rings and says, Tim, not telling you what to do, just saying, you know, I'm praying for you. You can't put value on that. You really can't. Okay, Beaver. Oh, that's the microphone. 
Sorry, you talked about um, quotas for, or suggested that maybe, you know, you wanted to look at quotas for how men and women could treat each other. As an educator, it's, isn't it more about mindsets and how did you uh, start changing mindsets uh, in your role as an educator? I think um, it does come down, this, this gets, starts to get pedagogically technical comes down to how you teach. Do you teach in terms of a, just a content dump? Or are you teaching for people to build skills that they can then apply in new situations and um, have the intellectual skills? So in education, assessment drives the mindset. If the assessment is about how much you can recall and how much you can regurgitate, um, you're going, to, you're going to deflect towards fixed mindsets. On the other hand, if you're trying to teach students, how do I take data and apply it to a new situation, then they have to have skills and ability to face new situations. One of the most distressing things you can hear as an educator leader when you know that some kids aren't getting it is, we weren't taught this. And what they mean is they weren't given precisely that question in some lead up practice. They have been taught everything they need to know. Um, what do you think is the future of single sex schools? Will co-education be the norm in the decades ahead? Is that good or bad? Um, education is the norm in New South Wales. So single sex schools education are- Education is the norm or the- Co-education right. is the norm. Single sex education therefore is a rarity. Um, I've run a co-ed school. I've worked in two boys schools. I think there are some crucial needs for boys that I think are best met in a boys' school. But that's not to say I would rather have my child go to a really good co-educational school than a mediocre single-sex school. But all things being equal, um, boys mature more slowly than girls. So when I was the head at, um, uh, at All Saints, if you're doing prefect selections, if you just went on pure merit, none of the boys would have been selected for, that, for, for, those, eight, for those eight positions. So, so, so is there, there a, quota, a quota, a quota there system? A quota because <laughs> I, I need to have a, a boys school captain. Um, and I remember one year when the top 12 students in the school at the HSC were all female. And that's, that is a maturity thing. Um, interestingly enough, in New Zealand, which still has the largest number of single sex boys schools and girls schools in the world. And I know their education system as a whole has been criticized, but the interesting data is they have that single sex schools across the socioeconomic spectrum and the data that's been published, um, and I can send it to you if anybody's interested, data that's been published shows that in those single sex schools, the boys in them whether they're from the poorest of the poor or the richest of the rich, they outperform boys in co-educational schools. I think girls do better in co-education than, than boys do. Well, we've really exceeded our time. John has been very patient. He came Tuesday and asked a question, but make it really quick, John. Oh, Stuart wanted to ask a question. Stuart did. All right, Stuart. Well, um, I was going to say, Stuart's the only other man in the room wearing braces, so I reckon he should get a good answer okay. as well. This will be our last question. Apologies for those who haven't got their question through. I, um, uh, I don't ordinarily care for schools like Shaw. I went to a school at the, that came in third last in terms of retention at the HSC. But I used to pray for your successor twice a day, going in and out of, of North Sydney uh, Station. He inherited a perfect storm, pandemic followed by the Great Resignation. If you were coming in now as the ninth uh, headmaster of Shaw, what would you do to rebuild? Um, I would make sure that the structures, the, the strong structures of the school that existed were honoured and uh, allowed to do their job, and they will. Um, I think that the, the, the you need to... Um, get in and listen to the, uh, the, the staff and the, um, uh, the make, make sure that you're hearing what they're saying. Um, I think you also need to make sure that 
in, the, in the ongoing structure of the school, um, you focus very heavily on the teaching and learning. Let's thank Tim again. Um, just very quickly, we're going to close in a short prayer. And Claudio, could you give the mic to Ian? I might ask Ian if you wouldn't mind saying a prayer. But before he does that, uh, thank you for joining online. Thank you for everyone who's come in the room. And if it's your first time, I hope it's not your last. I hope you do come back. What's in store? We offer small groups where we think through the things that our speakers have shared. We do them in person as well as online. If you would like to join one of those groups, speak to me. You'll get an email later today where you can indicate your interest in those small groups. In two weeks' time, we're going to, around the nation, combine through a Zoom where we're going to have a speaker from Adelaide. And then in about a month or so, we'll be back in this room with another speaker. So stay tuned for those May details. Sure. Um, on Tuesday, we had a slightly different direction in some of, some of the discussion. As a consequence of that, I sent through some recommended readings to Peter mm. and a, a link to a, a very good Trinity Forum uh, conversation. And so I'm sure Peter will share yeah. those with you as well. Happy. So if you're interested in any of that, just reply to the feedback email and I can send you that on to you. So, Ian, could you do the honours? Thank you, Peter. And thank you, Peter. I realised that you chose chosen me because you know that I went to an all-boys school, in fact, a real boys' boys school at Crowsnest Boys High, that is now a girls' school. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, whilst I was hoping that... Uh, Sorry, I asked you to pray. That was, it was pray, not to give a speech. I was hoping my grandsons wouldn't, wouldn't actually have to go to a private school. They got a late cancellation, and now one of them is at Shaw. So, thank you. But, Tim, um, just, dear Lord, we're just grateful for having Tim this morning, particularly uh, a wide range of experience and many good things to tell us and to demonstrate his own failings, but also the journey that he's lived through and uh, through his uh, stepmother particularly, finding you very early in his life and making the foundation for the rest of his life. We're just grateful for um, his sharing this morning, and we hope all, whether you're believers or not, will go forth and continue to grow. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, have a good day and weekend, gentlemen.